Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Way Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 20th of October, 2023. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So apologies for missing yesterday's episode, everyone. I mean, you guys know it's a regular occurrence at this point that I miss at least one episode a week these days, but I'm back today, and there's a bunch of stuff to get through, so let's get right into it. All right, I guess the first updates are around ETFs, and you guys are probably sick of hearing about ETFs by now, but I think it is one of the main kind of talking points of crypto right now, especially when it comes to the market side of things. But today's news is not about the BTC ETFs. It's actually about the ETH spot ETFs. So you can see here that Invesco uh, in partnership with Galaxy have filed for a spot ETH ETF. And this is the fifth currently active spot ETH ETF filing. And, and you can see here that uh, the, the list here that, that, that James has shared of the, uh, I guess, like uh, institutions that have put forward an application to get a spot ETH ETF. There's Vanek, Arc, Hashdex, Grayscale converting their trust to an ETF, and Invesco, Galaxy, uh, Ethereum ETF here. So, you know, it's kind of funny because I've been saying for a few months now that I've figured that we wouldn't get a spot ETH ETF until 2025. And then I told you guys that uh, some of these ETF analysts that I follow think that it could happen as soon as two to three months after the BTC spot ETF goes live, which kind of is amazing to me, to be honest, if they're right there, you know, that, that could mean that we get a ETH ETF in like what? If the, if the BTC ETFs go live in in January, let's just say, that means we could get an ETH spot ETF in like April or May or something like that, uh, or even earlier than that, which is is really amazing to me considering the language that has been used against ETH for a long time now from the SEC, SEC specifically Gary Gensler. But yeah, I mean, that you have the same organizations that have applied for BTC ETFs applying for ETH spot ETFs. Now, of course, or spot ETH ETFs. Now, of course, BlackRock isn't on this list yet. I think that'll be like the big mover, right? When BlackRock decides to, I guess, um, put forward an application for a spot ETH ETF. And I feel like they're going to do it. I mean, they're probably going to, they, they might wait until their BTC one gets approved because then they'll be emboldened and they'll think, okay, well, you know, we got the BTC one approved. We can get the ETH one approved now. But I think that'll really be when people start paying attention to like the spot ETH ETF narrative, right? Where they're like, oh my God, ETH is actually going to get an ETF as well. And of course, you know, we see, we're seeing the effect of what some um, on BTC of, of the hype, of the narrative. And I've always told you guys for, I mean, I think I've said this for years now, the narrative is more powerful than the reality. Because if you look at what BTC is doing lately price-wise, I mean, it just hit 30K. Like I'm looking at the chart right now. It's literally at like 30K. Um, ETH lagging a bit behind, but that makes sense because of the fact that the current narrative trade is BTC getting that spot ETF. So the market does believe that it's getting that spot ETF. And it's funny, I said the other day after we saw that fake news from Cointelegraph, that I actually think that we would uh, we would kind of uh, go back to 30k because I think a lot of people realize they were sidelined and realize that there's a lot of money waiting for the spot BTC ETF to go live, which means that the narrative is fully taken over now. The narrative is more powerful than the reality. And this goes for literally every single asset, guys. Like, th it, this doesn't just apply to BTC. It doesn't just apply to crypto. It applies to every single asset in the world, in my opinion. Anything that people speculate on, the narrative is always more powerful than the reality. And we see this play out in crypto across any number of different kind of coins and tokens, especially in bull markets, where you see people come up with the craziest stories and narratives for, uh, I guess, like justifying for why their coin is going to pump. And then if it catches on, the coin does pump. But the thing is, is that that's a short-term thing, right? It's a bull market phenomenon. In a bear market, these things get slaughtered because there's no more narratives to trade on. Really, the narrative juice is running out, the money's running out, so down you go because there's nothing holding up the, uh, the value of those things. There's no fundamentals, right? So narratives are very, very powerful um, when, when things are, are going good, but they, they don't really get you out of it. I mean, they don't save you when things are bad, right? What saves you when things are going bad or when the market turns into more of a bearish market is the fundamentals. And that's why you see things like BTC and ETH outperform pretty much everything uh, in, in the bear markets, right? And there might be some, one or two things that pump more than uh, or, or pump during a bear market that outperform ETH and BTC a little bit. Um, but that again is like a narrative thing, right? There's always kind of a narrative trade to be had there. So that's why I think that BTC has been pumping uh, because of the, the narrative around the spot ETH, ETF, spot BTC ETF. And the funny thing is we it could pump all the way until the, the um, ETFs get approved and then sell off, right? It'll be like a sell the news event. That's what, where sell the news comes from is where the, the narrative and the hype gets ahead of, of kind of like uh, the market. And then when the actual thing hits, it, it sells off. And 
I, coming back to my other point about like a spot ETH ETF narrative, I feel like that's just going to pick up steam uh, as time goes on as well. Like as the BTC ETF narrative kind of subsides and people get bored of that one, they'll latch onto the ETH one. And then, as I said, if BlackRock files for a spot ETH ETF, which is really what kicked off this BTC ETF uh, bonanza to, uh, to begin with a few months ago, if BlackRock was to file for a, a spot ETH ETF, then you could expect the exact same narrative trade to play out on, on ETH, of course. And then I think by that point, we're, we're already going to be in like a pretty pretty, uh, I guess, like heated bull market, because I've said before that I think that once we break out of those crab ranges that ETH and BTC are in, specifically BTC first, because BTC always runs first at the start of the cycle. Literally, it's been the case for pretty much every cycle in crypto. Um, I mean, BTC has had at least two more cycles than ETH because ETH didn't exist, but it's been the case for every single cycle. B BTC runs first, then everything else goes along with it. Uh, and that's why you that's what you're seeing playing out uh, right now. So if BTC breaks above, it's kind of like crab range there, which I think is like 32K on BTC right now. And, and then holds that and then continues kind of like following through with that and pumping through with that, that to me is the signal of, of, the, of the official start of the bull market. I already think that the bull market started like a, a little while ago. I think I mentioned that on the refuel, but that to me signals the official start, I guess. And then from then only, it's climbing that wall of worry uh, for, for next year. But then as I said to you guys, I still believe that we could be hitting all-time highs on BTC and ETH by the second half of next year uh, there. But no promises, of course, but yeah, it's just really positive to see that the uh that their spot uh, these uh, kind of issuers or I guess these applicants are wasting no time trying to get an ETH ET, a spot ETF approved as well. And if it's going to happen next year instead of in 2025, specifically in like the first half of next year, that would be really cool and really bullish. But as I said, you're going to see the narrative of this pick up before any uh, before it goes live, just like you see you've seen with BTC. So definitely something to keep in mind and definitely something to keep in mind when you're just, I mean, I, I'm, I, this isn't just for traders. It's also for investors because I think what happens to a lot of people is that they see things going up and then they're holding the thing that's not going up and they start getting FOMO and they're like, why is my thing not going up, right? Well, again, it's all the narrative stuff. It's all the, it's all the cycles. The markets work in cycles and narratives. And what ends up happening is, as I said, BTC typically will run first uh, out of a bear market and then the rest of the things will go. Uh, and then obviously we'll get another bear market once the bull market blows off. But to time that, to try and trade around that, to try and kind of like beat the market, so to speak, in my experience, having been around for, this will be my fourth cycle, uh, it's it's not impossible, but like you're so much better off just long term investing from not just like a profit perspective or a potential profit perspective, but also from a mental health perspective because, or, or I guess like mental stability perspective because it, like markets can really really screw with you, especially if you are I guess attached to the technology and you're biased towards the technology. Because uh, from what I can tell, the best traders in crypto are the ones that don't give a shit about the technology. All they care about is using crypto as a vehicle to stack more fear. They couldn't care less about any crypto. And that, that makes them good traders because they can remove or detach themselves from the market. Whereas if you're a fundamental investor and you're into the tech, you know, if you're listening to the refuel, I'm, I'm going to go uh, go out on a limb and say the average refuel listener is definitely not someone who could detach themselves from the tech in order to be a good trader. Maybe there's exceptions to that rule there, but I know for me personally, I could never be a trader. I have way too much bias towards Ethereum, you know, ETH and Ether the Ethereum ecosystem. I would just end up losing all my money. Uh, so yeah, anyway, enough about the, the markets there, but just figured I would highlight this, uh, that the spot ETH ETF, expect that narrative to kind of pick up steam, uh, I guess like over time. And yeah, I'll keep you guys updated on how those applications go there. All right, Coinbase has announced uh, they uh, have chosen Ireland to be their hub in the EU, so the EU Mika hub here. So I guess this is funny because uh, I saw some kind of chatter about this and people saying, uh, Coinbase is making waves in the EU more so than the US because Mika is that regulation that I don't know if it's in place yet, but that that's been proposed and and put and is going to be put in place in the EU for crypto, and it just makes it a lot easier for Coinbase to expand and do things that they can't do in the US in the EU. And we've already seen this happen with their kind of derivative exchange that US users can't access, and that is run out of I think Bermuda. Um, and th that went live the other day, and, and non-US persons can can access that 
and trade with leverage. But in the US, yeah, there's just been not, not really much progress there. And we know this story by now. This isn't news to you guys. But I also wanted to, uh, as, a, as a pivot point from this, also kind of mention the fact that I, I, I did mention the other day that I think the real enemy of crypto is not Gary Gensler. It's his boss, right? Elizabeth Warren. And I'm sure you've seen recently with this uh, kind of Israel, Israel and, and Hamas uh, kind of uh, conflict that's going on, uh, Elizabeth Warren is trying to blame crypto and trying to say that crypto is a main source of funding for Hamas, right? For terrorists. And this is typical of politicians who are trying to attack something, right? They go for like the terrorism financing or they go for like the child exploita exploitation stuff or drugs or whatever, right? The, the things that get the headlines and get people on side, so to speak, or the casual observer on side. But if you actually dive into the details here, which a lot of, uh, I guess, um, people have done and you've probably seen it on Twitter. I think Chain Analysis did a did a blog post or a thread on this, it shows that Hamas stopped accepting BTC for their financing quite a while ago, and they've stopped using crypto altogether because it's just too easily traced back to them, right? And we all know this because Bitcoin doesn't have privacy, and you can you can use mixes, but then they're not you know they're not foolproof and they're not that great, right? Um, but the Bitcoin network by default doesn't have privacy. The Ethereum network by default doesn't have privacy, and Tornado Cash on Ethereum is is probably not big enough uh, to handle the kind of size that these groups want to move, right? So when you think about it like that, uh, and you look at the actual numbers, I mean, it doesn't match up with what Elizabeth Warren is saying. The reality does not match up with her narrative, right? Just going back to what I was saying before. So I think that just further reinforces my point that the real enemy of crypto in the US, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren is a high-ranking Democrat and she has other, other others on side, but she is the source of it. From what I've seen, I'm not going to put all the blame on her, but she is a very big source of the anti-crypto rhetoric of the US government, which is currently uh, Democratic, right, in the, in the Senate. And then the presidential uh, kind of arm is democratic right now. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if that's going to change next year with the election. I, I feel like next year's election is going to be, I always hate the U.S. election cycle, right? I mean, I'm not even in the U.S. and I have to hear about it all the time. It's going to be a, a mess, right? And I don't even know, like at this point in time, I have no idea who's going to win. Like, is it going to be the Republicans? Like the presidency, I should say. Is it going to be the Democrats? I would rather the Democrats lose for crypto because the Republicans are friendlier. But that's kind of like the one issue voter stuff that people uh, talk about. Um, within crypto, they're like, you know what, crypto is my livelihood. I, I, I hope the the Republicans win because they're they're friendlier for crypto. But then there's a whole host of other things that people vote on. You know, I think crypto is probably not a uh, one issue vote for most people in the US. So it's too hard to tell. And I've got no read on, on US politics, to be honest, and I, I don't even like talking about it. But I think it's relevant to the discussion around the US and their stance on crypto. And as I said, I think Elizabeth Warren is definitely one of the main sources, if not the main source of the anti-crypto rhetoric the fact that she's trying to link crypto to terrorist groups and that's and she's trying to push through legislation specifically tax related legislation using that reasoning, trying to rush it through, is gross to me. And it's really sad that Coinbase is caught in the crosshairs here because Coinbase obviously is an amazing company, but and they're a US-born company. They're traded on the US stock exchange, right, as a, as a public company, but they have to go to other places to expand uh, and they can't uh, offer those same products in these other places than they, uh, that they can in the US, right, or than they can in the US, which is just insane to me. But anyway, I'm going to leave that one at that. Uh, yeah, congrats to Coinbase for... Or, uh, I guess, like expanding to Ireland here for their EU Mika hub. All right, so I mentioned this tweet the other day from Gajinda around EIP 4844 and um, the blob style transactions and what that would take up in blocks. Well, Dan Crad uh, had some uh, had some kind of like extra points to add to Gajinda's tweet here, which I, I just wanted to, to read out. So he said that Gajinda's uh, tweet thread was based on completely empty execution blocks, except for the blob transaction. So this makes the blobs equal zero K seem unnaturally fast, uh, whereas in reality, it would obviously be slower because there would be other things in the blocks. Um, execution time, of course, matters. Uh, as long as blobs arrive within the time it takes for the execution layer to verify the block, no actual delay in the importing would occur. Uh, and the Lodestar client has been uh, has been one of the slower clients uh, and particularly struggled with large blocks. But this analysis would probably look better with more popular clients because he, uh, Gajinda did this analysis on Lodestar. But Lodestar is, go you know, is always improving as a client and he's probably going to fix that by the time yeah, P44, uh, 4844 goes live on the network. Yeah, so just a bit of extra analysis done. I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to read fully. Um, but I've, I, I basically covered the gist of it there. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, there's no 
kind of change on timeline for Denkun. Q1 seems, you know, most likely Jan Feb or something like that. Uh, testing's going well. I think DevNet 10 is launching very soon. Um, I haven't kept up to date with that. I think there's some core devs calls um, and they mentioned DevNet 10. I think this week uh, or next week, maybe. Uh, so once that goes um, and then they'll be scheduling the public test nets, Girly comes first. And then after that, I'm not sure if it's going to be Sepolio, Whole Sky, uh, Girly first, obviously, because it's being deprecated by the end of the year. And then Sepolio and Whole Sky and then Mainnet. Uh, so Mainnet, probably Jan Feb, I think at this at this, uh, at this this time. I know I've been wrong on the timelines before. I know I said November, <laughs> uh, you know, for over the last few months. But as I said, uh, testing took longer than, than it was anticipated. And there was a lot of bugs and stuff like that and obviously it's a major change uh, eip 48 44 which is not the only eip there are other eips uh coming in denkun uh, but because of that and because it's the end of the year and the holiday period i kind of got pushed out to jan feb there but i'll keep you guys updated on timelines around that all right, so I had a few people ask me uh, what Swell's roadmap looks like because uh, I guess like Swell has been uh, talked about a bit on the refuel lately with the initiatives that they're running, like that Zap initiative that I talked about the other day, which by the way, is not technically a vampire attack. Uh, it's more so a way to restore the fair value of SW ETH, which is, which is trading at a discount because there's no withdrawal for Swell right now. Withdrawals are going live uh, early next year for, for Swell. Um, but in terms of a roadmap, uh, Swell put out this tweet where they actually went through what's on the horizon for Swell. So if you wanted to know what was on the horizon, you can go check this out. But the three main uh, focus areas, or I guess like there's more than three, but um, the first one is Swellnomics. So implementing curve style vote escrow and gauge flywheel systems within the Swell ecosystem for when the Swell token goes live. Enabling withdrawals, as I mentioned. Um, decentralized innovation with things like DVT uh, and uh, expanding the LST FI ecosystem. So obviously deepening integrations for the SWETH token across DeFi um, and liquid restaking primitives as well. So they're conducting research and development there. So you can go check out this uh, forum post and this tweet. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. It's got a bunch of details, as I said, around Swell and what they're going to be looking like over the next, maybe, I guess, yeah, I guess you could say six to 12 months or something like that. But yeah, I'm excited to see how that goes there. And you guys know I'm an investor in, in Swell. Um, I, I, I just have to disclose that as usual. But I think that if you look at, um, I, I, I don't know if Rated.network uh, tracks Swell. I don't think they do. But I mean, obviously, Swell is just one of many protocols that is working to get uh, Lido's dominance down. But you can see here, Lido's dominance is actually still coming down. So it's at 31.8% now, which is really, really great to see. Um, and obviously, the, there's not really much people entering staking right now or, or exiting. But the thing is, is that when they do enter, where are they going? And now they have a lot more options than just Lido uh, to go to. Uh, and also I should mention that Lido's uh, uh, additional node operators are now online. So they now have th 36 node operators instead of 31. So, you know, people love to bash on Lido. And and, and I, I think I've been one in the past who have taken a more, taken a more nuanced view here. The fact that they've just onboarded a bunch of uh, more node operators is actually good for not only Lido, but good for Ethereum as well. Because now there is 36 independent node operators instead of 31. Obviously, Rockapool still re reigns supreme here with the thousands of independent node operators that Rockapool has. I mean, it's not even close, right? But I think that we should be applauding any kind of efforts to decentralize and I guess like take power away from the center. Uh, and that's exactly what, what Lido is doing here. Oh, and I just noticed that uh, Raider.network updated their Coinbase percentage share as well. Remember, I, I covered this the other day about how they were undercounting Coinbase at around 9%. And the, the true count is at 14.2% here. You know, it's funny because there's, there's this constant debate. I guess, among the com community about what's worse, Coinbase or Lido, right? So is it worse that Coinbase has 14.2% versus Lido's 31.8% market share? I, I don't really have a strong opinion either way on this. I think you can make arguments for both sides. But what I will say is that when it comes to the comparison between these two, Coinbase as an entity, right, is one entity. They have complete and total control over those 14.2% uh, of, the, of the validators of the, of the network share that they have. All of their validators are completely owned and controlled by the Coinbase entity, not by anyone else. Yes, there may be some legal, uh, I guess, like uh, arrangements in place with uh, providers that they use, such as Alluvial, which is an institutional grade staking provider and, and others out there that guarantees that Coinbase actually doesn't really uh, I mean, they have they have control over the validators, but they don't technically own it. I don't know if that that exists, but it's safe to assume that Coinbase obviously has total control over those validators. Now, when you look at and compare that to Lido, 
Lido is not one entity, right? There's 36 node operators. The Lido entity is really the governance entity that sits on top of those node operators. But when you look at it like this, uh, and I've explained this before, and I talked about this with Eric on our last podcast, the 36 node operators, uh, they, they operate independently, right? The validators are independent. There is no one Lido entity at the top that can control what the node operators do. They could technically, not, not even technically, they could put social pressure on the node operators to do certain things, but they can't actually force the node operators, um, you know, unilaterally to do things that they want to do. And, and, and they, in this kind of instance, is Lido governance, right? Which again, isn't one entity either, but I mean, it's not very decentralized, right? There is like three or four addresses that basically control it. Uh, which, you know, we don't even know if they're the same person. They're probably under the same umbrella, whether it's the team or, or VCs, right? Um, but when th that's the argument that people make. It's like, okay, would you rather Coinbase at, you know, 14% or Lido at 31%? Uh, and honestly, I think neither are good. I would like to see, I would not like to see any centralized exchange above 10%. And this is another reason why I have an issue with that 22% number that people are pushing around because not all entities are created equal here. Like for example, if solo stake is, we're at 22% of, of market share. And if Rockapool was at 22% market share and Rockapool uh, was, was fully decentralized, maybe the ODAO had been dissolved, right? Then that would be much, 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 much better than Coinbase or Lido being at 22%, right? Um, or, or Coinbase and Binance and Kraken being at 22%. So I think that you can't just put like a, I guess, like a static number on it. You actually have to look at what the service is. Uh, and I think, you know, solo st if solo staking was like 100% of the network, I, I don't even think that would be a bad thing, to be honest. Um, but it also depends on what that looks like. What's the distribution? You know, how many actual solo stakers are there? How many node operators are there? Uh, things like that. But yeah, I, I I think that when thinking it through these things and when looking at this, you can't look at them as if they're equal. Because to me, Coinbase having 14%, um, you know, I, I, I don't like that. I want them below 10%. I don't want any centralized exchange above 10%. I don't want any centralized service above 10% because Lido is kind of in the middle where it's like not decentralized, but it's not centralized. It's like a pseudo kind of... I, get, I don't even, I wouldn't even call it pseudo decentralized. It's like in the middle, right? Because it has a different design where there is those distinct node operators. Whereas with Coinbase, it's just them. With Binance, it's just them. With Kraken, it's just them. Um, and with obviously Rockapool, it's, it's, it's very, very different. There's thousands of node operators. So, and this goes back to what I've always said is where the number one thing that matters the most with Ethereum staking is node operator distribution. Regardless of what umbrella they fall under, uh, the more distributed and the more independent the node operators are, the healthier the Ethereum network is uh, overall there. But anyway, I'm going to continue here. I'm already 22 minutes in and I haven't even gotten through half of what we have today. So this is going to be a longer episode than usual. And then you guys also have tomorrow's episode with Eric to look forward to. We talked all about the, um, the new Unisop front end fee and just fees within DeFi. And we talked a lot about public goods funding and, and EIP 1559, how that falls into to it. So yeah, you guys are spoiled for content. But anyway, moving on. So uh, this is a new update from Eigenlayer. So Eigenlayer has announced something called the Eigenlayer Research Fellowship, which is a research team where they said that the Eigenlayer research team currently has bandwidth to work with five fellows deeply on a topic that they care about uh, and interest us, us being the Eigenlayer team here. So if you are interested in working with the Eigenlayer research team, you can go and apply here. I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you, for you to check out. But yeah, this is probably very similar to, I guess, the core protocol fellowship that I mentioned a few months ago that people kind of applied to and and got involved with. And I would say this is probably, uh, yeah, probably on par with the core protocol stuff because with, with the restaking ecosystem, it's brand new. You're going to be working on bleeding edge research and development topics. It's going to be very tightly coupled with the Ethereum protocol itself. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun doing it. So yeah, you can go apply here. The applications are open till October 27th. So about a week from today, I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to check out. And there's a bunch of info in this blog post as well for you to check out there. All right, speaking of restaking, uh, I basically was quoted in a few times in this new t uh, article from Cointelegraph talking all about Ethereum restaking. It was penned by Max Parasol here. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of comments from me in there, but the article overall is really solid. So if you're interested in, interested in learning about restaking generally um, and Eigenlayer, definitely go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Probably the things that I said aren't going to be new to, to you guys, to be honest, but there are quotes from other people in there that 
and and obviously Max has written a bunch of, of of stuff as well that you should definitely read. Um, but it goes over the things like you know why you know what are the potential risks of restaking, what are the potential rewards, and and and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, highly recommend giving this a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But the piece concludes with what I've always said is that you know if Ethereum can't handle restaking um, as a thing, then Ethereum has not been designed correctly. I've always said that, guys. Like I, I think that's been like my motto for for a while now. With anything when it comes to Ethereum, is that if the Ethereum protocol can't handle it then it needs to be fixed to handle it so to speak right because it's been designed incorrectly uh that's always been my kind of view there but anyway we'll link this in the youtube description below you can go check it out all right, so just a quick shout out here to Ave. So Mark Zeller here, uh, who is part of the Ave DAO, said, uh, tweeted out saying, staking diversity is important and we propose the current batch of Ave DAO Treasury LST acquisition to proceed with a 100% Rockapool ETH uh, integration or I guess like allocation and 0% ST ETH allocation. So very cool to see that uh, Ave Governance is taking this seriously and not going with Lido for their next batch here of, of, of capital allocation here. So they're going with 100% RETH. And you know, I, I think I've said this before where I, where I said that I, I think a big reason why a lot of not just DAOs, but like people generally staked with Lido to begin with was because STETH was really liquid. It was really the only kind of like option for bigger players to get involved with. But you know, RETH has been around for a while now and is definitely uh, just as big of a player as, as STETH is. But then you also have others out there. So maybe they want to be as diversified as possible. So maybe the next time Ave, the Ave Dow uh, allocates funds to staking, they go with like Swell ETH or they go with Diva ETH or they go with uh, whatever else ETH out there, another LST, instead of going with with our ETH. And b because obviously we want to see the love shared and and I don't think they're going to be going with ST ETH anymore, to be honest, because that wouldn't make much sense since Lido's market share is so so big already. But yeah, just, just, just really cool to see this because I think that when you look at DAOs um, and, and look at the money that they have and where they're allocating it to, they are definitely going to be the ones that move the needle in a big way because they have a lot of, uh, I guess, like funds that they can put towards different solutions. And with Ave DAO going towards Rockapool ETH instead of ST ETH, yeah, it actually moves the needle in a really big way. So yeah, kudos to them for doing this. Um, great to see it. All right, so you can contribute to a new trusted setup ceremony if you're interested. So this is for the ZK MACI or Minimal Anti-Collusion Infrastructure uh, 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 kind of trusted setup ceremony here. The deadline is October 24th, so you've got four days to do this. You can go to ceremony.pse.dev to get involved here. Uh, it is more involved than the KZG ceremony. I think you do have to uh, 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 play around the command line and run some code and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm not going to run through how to do that on the um, on the reef. Fuel, but yeah, I just wanted to shout this out for anyone that was interested. You can go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so a big announcement out of Polygon uh, over the last couple of days that I'm actually directly involved with. So Polygon has announced the new Protocol Council, which will be responsible for stewarding the Polygon Protocol towards Polygon 2.0. Now, this council is made up of a bunch of various individuals from across the crypto ecosystem, not just the Ethereum ecosystem, which is which is uh, uh, great to see, of course. But uh, you know, yours truly is involved in this, so I am one of the signers. It's basically, I mean, I don't want to water down what this protocol council is but i mean it's a it's a multi-sig where we're all in the multi-sig and we're charged with making sure and reviewing all of the changes that are going towards getting polygon 2.0 over the line and obviously signing um and, and signing transactions and signing upgrades and stuff like that in order to make sure that uh, that things get delivered and doing it in a, I guess, more decentralized way than it would be done by just the Polygon team uh, being in control of it. So, and th this is just a temporary thing, by the way, the Protocol Council is not meant to last forever. It's just meant to get Polygon 2.0 up and running. And then once that's going, they can decentralize out the governance to Matic or Pol token holders. So, so yeah, but in the meantime, they obviously needed a, tr uh, a trusted and a bunch of independent people to to handle this and to to kind of like steward this along. So you can check out the full list of people that are involved in this. I'll link it in the YouTube description. But besides me, I mean, some of the names you will recognize, uh, Justin Drake, of course, <laughs> Zach XBT. That was actually a surprise to me because Zach XBT, as I said, is like, he's not in Ethereum or in Bitcoin or, or in, in crypto, so to speak, I guess. Like he, he's, he's, he's someone who obviously we all know uh, as calling out scammers, you know, doing investigations and a really respected community member. So it's, and I, I don't think I've seen him part of these sorts of things before. So it's, it's just great to see him on here because he has built himself 
up a really great reputation within the within the community here. But then you can see that other people from other entities like Victor Bunin from Coinbase, uh, so from, from Exchange there, Zaki here from Somalia Finance is part of the Cosmos ecosystem. So as I said, not in Ethereum e ecosystem. And then a bunch of others here, I'm not going to I'm not going to, to name them all. You can check them out. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But also worth noting, there's only two people from Polygon Labs on, on the signer. So most of the signers, the vast majority, are not uh, are not uh, directly involved with Polygon. You guys know I'm an advisor to Polygon, but I'm not directly involved with Polygon. I'm not on the the, the kind of like payroll. I'm not an employee or anything like that of, of Polygon Labs, I should say, uh, there. So yeah, very cool to see this. And you can actually go read this blog post here. I should say very cool to see this now live because it has been in the works for a little bit. But you can go see the blog post here about uh, what it's actually entailing uh, and and what the what power the protocol council will actually have. And then you can also see what principles were used for member selection as well uh, and all of the members kind of various bios here uh, as well. So yeah, I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to check out. And I will actually note that um, the, the regular changes require a 7 uh, of 13 signers. So it's a 7 of 13 kind of uh, multi-sig there uh, where and, and, um, uh, and there is a 10-day time lock. So it requires 7 of us out of the 13 of us to sign uh, and then there is a 10-day time lock on that for regular changes. But And then emergency changes require 10 of the 13 people and there's no time lock. So I think that's actually a pretty good way of doing things because obviously time locks are critically important to make sure that people have time to review the changes. But in the event of an emergency, there's no point having a time lock because it's an emergency, right? And we've actually seen in the past how a time lock on things that that are emergencies is actually not a, a good way to do it because then what ends up happening is that you can't address the, the emergency in a timely manner. So the fact that the emergency changes while requiring more signers have no time lock is a good trade-off there because it does require almost all of the signers to to actually agree to it and to sign here, uh, which I thought was a, was, a, was a happy middle ground there. But anyway, I'll link this in the YouTube description and you can go check it out for yourself. All right, so a new website uh, for the Retroactive Public Goods Funding Initiative from Optimism is now live. So this is at retropgf.com. So on this website, you'll be able to explore the, I guess, like retroactive public goods funding rounds, uh, previous rounds. So round one and round two are here to see the results of the round and to see who was, uh, I guess, like a, a beneficiary of the funds, uh, such as the education beneficiaries, infrastructure one, tooling and utilities, uh, and so on and so forth. You can click through to them and you can actually see and it links to exactly what they are here. And this is great because it actually was buried in blog posts before seeing all the different rounds and all the different results here. So the fact that there's now a website for it uh, is really, really uh, great. And it's like a centralized repository for, for all of this here. So yeah, kudos to the team for putting this together. Uh, and you can go check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, or you can go to retropgf.com. All right, so CowSwap has an update today uh, which with a funny little video here, which I'll let you watch. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But now on CowSwap, you can actually not only trade uh, gaslessly, but you can approve tokens gaslessly as well. So for those of you who have used CowSwap before, you know that uh, all of the trades that you do on there are gasless because the gas fee is actually built into the trade itself. Now, uh, the same is true for token approvals. So essentially what happens is that the token approval and trade, it just becomes one transaction essentially, and you will sign that as you normally do on, on CowSwap. And then the uh, gas fee for the approval and the swap are handled as part of the order there. And this just makes the experience even more seamless than it already is. Honestly, guys, I don't think I'm exaggerating at this point when I say that CowSwap is my favorite DEX right now. I, I use it so much. It is just so good. I never feel like I'm getting a bad deal. I always feel like I'm I'm in control of, of what I'm doing on there. I always feel safe on there. I always feel like I'm going to be protected against MEV. And more often than not, I get like a really, really, really good price on my on my trade that is better than uh, the competitors out there. And also, uh, 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 CowSwap is part of like the Gnosis family. It was spun out of Gnosis. And as you guys know, Gnosis has been a really great contributor to the Ethereum ecosystem for quite a while now. So I like supporting them uh, because of that there. And I'm not paid to say any of this. I don't hold any CowSwap tokens or anything like that. Um, but when it comes to decentralized a decentralized exchange experience, especially for for me who doesn't do, uh, you know, I don't do frequent trades, but, one, people, uh, but I usually do market trades 
and things like that. And you can do other, you can do limit orders and TWOP stuff on CowSwap as well. But for me, when I when I look to go and get the best execution on the, the swap that I want to do, I always go to CowSwap first. It's become my default. And even more so now that Uniswap is charging a fee for their front end. I mean, I can't use Uniswap using the, the using the contracts directly. I could use some other interfaces out there, but CowSwap is actually just one of those interfaces because the liquidity providers in the background will source the liquidity from anywhere, basically. Um, the only drawback of CowSwap is that I don't know if it's live on on any L2s yet, but the L2s that I've tried it on, I think Optimism and Arbitrum, uh, it doesn't actually work on yet. I'm sure that they're going to put it live on there eventually. Um, but yeah, on, on mainnet, it works flawlessly. So on Ethereum mainnet, it works, works flawlessly. So yeah, just cool to see them integrate this because again... As I said, this just makes the uh, approval, uh, I guess like the swapping process just that much more smoother because you get to approve and swap in one transaction gaslessly and just built into your order and you get like a smooth trade experience there. So you can go check this out for yourself. We'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so Gitcoin Grants Round 9 will be going live on November 15th until the 29th. So not Round 9, Round 19. Oh, round 9 was quite a while ago now. So yeah, I mean, again, this is just Gitcoin Grants doing its thing where you can fund your favorite projects and it'll get matched by various funds. I don't know what the matching amount is yet, but I think the last round was like a million dollars or something like that. And in a bear market, that's obviously really, really great to see there. But um, yeah, I mean, this is still about three weeks away from, from today. So definitely time to get some funds under your belt in order to to donate on on Gitcoin grants here, and you know the way the market's going, maybe you guys are making money finally. Maybe people are finally <laughs> making some money from the the crab market here, but. Regardless of that, you don't actually have to donate much because of those matching funds. It's obviously the quadratic matching that goes on where you could donate a dollar per project and maybe only donate up to 10 projects or something like that and it'll be matched and your donation goes a lot longer, a lot longer than, a lot more further than just that $1 that you've donated there. So yeah, just keep in mind the dates, mark your calendars, November 15th to the 29th for Gitcoin Grants Round 19. All right, so I just wanted to highlight this thread from Cryptocurrency Jobs. This is a really, really great thread all about what the current crypto slash Web3 job market looks like right now. Uh, and honestly, the key insight for me, even though the, the whole thread's good and you should go read it, I'll link it in the YouTube description below. The key insight for me was what they said here. They say, um, generally, the folks that transition uh, back to Web2 from Web3 Web are doing so because they can't find work in Web3 right now. There just aren't enough opportunities and many hope to return when the market picks up. So I think the jobs market is the last kind of market to feel the effects of the crab slash bear because what ends up happening is that you have the public market, you know, go down, right? And, and, and dump. Then you have the private markets dump, which is on like a six month lag. And then you have these teams that have gotten funded and, 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 and are continuing to kind of like burn through their funding, um, not want to let go of employees, not want to cut staff, not want to stop hiring because that, I mean, from an optics perspective, it doesn't look good for them. And also they don't want to put people out of a job as well, right? And they want to hold on to the good staff that they have, of course. Um, so that all typically has a six to 12 month lag. And we're there right now, right? If you want, if you say the bear market started November, 2022, uh, it's 12 months since then, right? Uh, oh, sorry, not the bear, didn't start in November, 2022. It, uh, the, the, um, the, the bottom was November, 2022, but the bear market started at, at what? The beginning of, of 2022, or like 24 months into that right now. Um, but I think this started a few months ago where the opportunities dried up. There were lots of layoffs happening, stuff like that. So yeah, six, 12 months after the, uh, not the public market dump, but the private market, um, I guess, valuations coming down and stuff like that. It basically puts us where we are today. Um, but yeah, that, that key insight there saying that people aren't going back to Web 2 because they don't like Web 3. They just can't find the right opportunities for themselves right now. Now, of course, when things heat up again, these people are going to come roaring back and, uh, hopefully they're going to be able to find roles for, within teams that now have more money to, to play around with, have been able to raise new funding and get these smart and good people to build within Web3 rather than uh, within Web2, of course, because that's what we want to do. We want, the, we want to brain drain Web2 uh, into Web3 here. But anyway, you can go check out this whole thread for yourself. It's got a bunch of great insights in it. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. 
All right, finally here, I've got a new bull market tip for all of you guys that maybe I should have spoken about at the start of the episode because I realized I spent 10 minutes at the start of the episode going on a bit of a bullish rant. Um, I didn't expect me, my, me to do that at the start of the episode, but this bull market pro tip that I put out today, which is number six of my pro tips, I said, in the heart of the bull market, it'll be very tempting to fall into the up only or super cycle trap where you begin to believe there won't be another bear market. When you start to fall into this trap, it is probably the best time to start taking profits as the bull market is more than likely coming to to an end in the near future. There will always be another bear market in crypto, just like there will always be another bull market. All markets are cyclical and will continue to be as long as humans are involved. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think I've spoken about this a bunch of times on the review before, but guys, please, for the sake of everything, do not fall into this trap. I've fallen into this trap before. It is not a good trap to fall into because you do convince yourself and you do believe that things are just going to go up forever. And why this is bad is because it prevents you from taking profits. It stops you from taking the, the massive profits that you may have, and it makes you a bag holder, as we, we, we like to refer to them within the crypto industry. Uh, this happened to me in 2017. It, it happened to me in 2013 as well, but it happened to me in 2017. Not necessarily with ETH, to be honest. I bought my ETH pretty pretty cheaply uh, back then, but it happened with other things. There was one thing that I bought, uh, Aeon, it was called, it was some interoperability layer one that was all the rage back then. I held that down like 95% in 2018, and then I sold it. <laughs> I was still, I think, slightly up against ETH because ETH went down like 90, what is it, 4% or something like that. ETH got just as slaughtered and I had bought Aon at like a lower ETH price or something like that. So I was up in ETH. But guys, the reason I held it is because I kind of fell into this thing of, oh, you know, uh, at the beginning of 2018, I was like, oh, okay, we're just blowing off for now. We'll come back soon, right? The, you know, it's not going to be that long of a bear market. Obviously, I severely underestimated the market and how long the bear market would last. Um, and Aon never came back, by the way. So I became a bag holder. And there were other things as well, but that was like the quintessential example here. And that's because I fell into this trap. I saved myself from falling into this trap in 2021. I still kind of fell into it a little bit where I held some things that I maybe I should have sold back then because I got a little bit attached to them. But I feel like at this point in time, I'm not attached to anything except my ETH. And you guys know I'm not planning to sell my ETH anyway. Um, but I, I just really implore you. This isn't investing advice. This is just general kind of like, I guess, common sense at this point for me. And it should be common sense for everyone. There is no such thing as an up only market. There is no such thing as a super cycle. Every single market, crypto or otherwise, is cyclical. It will have good times. It will have bad times. Your job as an investor is to buy in the bad times, by not, and not just any asset, buy assets that you, you believe and have a really, uh, uh, I guess, like a relevant thesis around that will do well in the good times and then take profits in the good times. Your job isn't to sit on an asset forever. And I mean, ugh, as I said, like I'm not selling my ETH. I'm basically sitting on my ETH forever, but that's because I have other assets that I've sold in the past. And that's also because I have other assets that I'm going to sell this time. So it's not like I'm holding every asset that I have. It is You always need to take profits at, at a point, especially when you're up massively. I mean, I know people who are up like 100x on things and they didn't take profits. Like, what the hell are you waiting for at that point? You're up 100x. If you put in 10 grand, you're, you're up 100x to a million dollars. You just made a million dollars. What what are you waiting for? And you know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for $2 million. They're waiting for $3 million because they convinced themselves that it's going to go up only. And if they sell now, they're going to miss out. And you know what? Who cares? Who cares if it goes from a million to $2 million and you missed out because you sold it a million, you still made a million dollars or almost a million. I mean, 10 grand's your principal, right? You still made almost a million dollars. Like who gives a shit, right? You basically de-risked massively and took profits and, and now you can just sit comfortably. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier in the episode where I said that your um, it's much better for your mental health to take profits. <laughs> it's much better for your mental health not to be a trader. And on top of all of this as well, uh, when you think about kind of, uh, I guess, like uh, making money and taking profits in, in the markets here, uh, you, you also have to take profits uh, uh, at your, on your own kind of like cadence. No one can tell you when to take profits. No one can tell you when to uh, essentially um, sell or, or buy or anything like that. You have to make up your own decisions there because at the end of the day, you're in control of what you do and you have to be conscious of that. 
as well there. But yeah, I'm going to stop the rant there because I'm at 42 minutes. Yeah, longer refuel than than usual, as I as I said before. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. As I said, you got tomorrow's episode with Eric Connor to look forward to, the new drive through episode talking about a bunch of different stuff around Ethereum. So yeah, you can go check that one out tomorrow. But on that note, that's it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks everyone.